It's a dream that is decades in the making, the world's largest radio telescope. Now this ambitious project, called the Square Kilometre Array, is taking shape in remote areas of Australia and South Africa, where it will eventually search for alien life and peer into the cosmic dark ages. I'm thrilled to welcome two guests today from the Square Kilometer Array Observatory. We have Phil Diamond, who's the Director General of the Observatory, and Sherry Breen, the Observatory's Head of Science Operations. Thank you for taking the time to talk to us about this amazing project. You're most welcome. Good to be here. Thanks for having us. This is just a pretty incredible and ambitious project. Could you just give us an overview of what the Square Kilometer Array is and why it is going to be such an important tool for radio astronomy? So the SKA uh, will be the next generation global radio observatory, which will allow astronomers worldwide to make advances in a number of, of astronomy fields. There are 16 countries involved um, in the SKA. Uh, the, those countries have just created a brand new entity. It's, a, it's an intergovernmental organization a, a tr a, governed by a treaty. It's the next generation uh, radio observatory. Uh, radio astronomy has been around since the um, early 30s, actually. Uh, so it's, it's a relatively young science in the scheme of things. And primarily at that point, the concept was to observe hydrogen most common element in the universe. At that point, it was thought a square kilometer would be appropriate, hence the, uh, the name of the project. But we're not gonna build a large single dish that's a, that's a square kilometer in size. It, it's, that, that's too much of a challenge. So what was decided is we would uh, build an interferometer. That is uh, many hundreds of dishes whose signals could be combined uh, to, to give the equivalent collecting area of a square kilometre. It is going to be truly groundbreaking in terms of the immensity. Could you give us a sense of how many of these um, single dishes will be part of the interferometer, part of the array, and how much land this is going to cover across the two locations in, in Southern Africa and, um, and Australia? So in, in the Karoo in South Africa, remote part of the country, uh, we will have uh, ultimately 197 dishes Mm. Uh, each dish approximately 15 meters in, in diameter. Wow. Um, it's 64 of those dishes already exist. Those 197 dishes will be um, spread across an area with a diameter of about 150 kilometers. We're, we're using what are called log periodic antennas. So um, the, the older viewers or readers may remember the old TV antennas we used to have on our, on our roofs that would, would point uh, to a TV transmitter. Well, these are cousins of those. They, they look like two meter tall Christmas trees and we'll have 132,000 of these. Truly mind boggling and it's very interesting. Why these two locations? What makes them good for radio astronomy? Ideally, we would have wanted the, the two telescopes to, to be together, but um, practically, pragmatically and politically, um, in order to uh, maximize the number of countries engaged in the project and to take full advantage of the, the radio astronomy communities um, in Australia, South Africa and elsewhere around the world. Uh, it was decided uh, back in 2012 that the, the, the two telescopes um, could quite naturally be uh, physically uh, located in Australia and, and South Africa. And a key element uh, is uh, radio quietness. Mm. So we, we humans and all, all of our gadgets and equipment, we generate radio noise. And uh, that, that's, that's, that's to a radio astronomer, that's like shining a torch uh, down the, uh, the end of, a of, a, of an optical telescope. What's the distinction between using a single dish and having an array like this? And, and do you think the future of radio astronomy is more toward that array concept? I think there's always going to be a place uh, for single dish and array. Um, there's a wealth of, of astronomy questions that astronomers are trying to answer. Um, but there's a limitation uh, to the collecting area that, that you can have with a single dish. You know, having having something that's a square kilometre in size and trying to steer that, I mean, you can see obviously that that's not going to work very well. 
So there are a lot of advantages um, to splitting up that collecting area over a number of telescopes, like as we do with the SKA. Um, it allows us to get that, that extreme level of collecting area, which helps us detect the really weak signals from space. But also in spreading them out, we can synthesize a telescope of a much larger diameter. And that extra resolution that we get using an array can really help us work out what's going on on the smaller scales in some of these um, astronomy investigations. What is that gonna to amount to in terms of how much more sensitive this telescope is compared to ones that are operating now? The SKA will be so sensitive that it will be able to detect an airport radar on a planet that's tens of light years away. Just how much more sensitive uh, the SKA telescopes will be compared to the existing facilities depends on a number of things, such as the frequency of the observation, so that's how long the wavelength is that's of interest to the astronomer, but for most science cases, we'll do at least a factor of a few better and much better than that um, for, for other science cases. Mm. Um, the way we get that additional sensitivity um, is through the large number of dishes that Phil mentioned earlier, um, or stations in the case of the low telescope. That gives us a huge, huge advantage because it, it increases our collecting area. Can you give us a sense of how deep in time this array will be able to look and is, is it like deeper than than anything else before? So astronomers uh, will use the SKA uh, to map the neutral hydrogen in the epoch of reionization re and the cosmic dawn and verify whether the results uh, match with their theoretical expectations. Things like how is the gas distributed uh, during the different phases? How was it ionized? How was it heated? Being able to use the SKA to study uh, the neutral hydrogen uh, at the earliest stages of the universe really opens up the largely unexplored era of the universe um, and will allow astronomers to answer a lot of questions. Will this array actually be able to spot the first stars or is that kind of a hard thing to do on the cosmic horizon like that? The signals are going to be very, very weak, right. um, but but I, I think we, we have the, the best opportunity um, with the SKA to be able to do that. It's a time machine, uh, really, uh, but producing a movie of the, from effectively the dawn of the universe uh, up until now. We'll be able to, to observe the universe uh, all the way back uh, to this, this, this point, this epoch of reionization, which is um, a few hundred million or, or maybe a billion years after the Big Bang haven't quite yet determined when that point is. Uh, but we'll be able to go back there and then watch the universe evolve. How is this array going to help us to uh, hopefully maybe find signs of, of life in, on other planets? Whether or not it's intelligent or not, I think is a really important distinction here. Um, so to, to search for intelligent life, uh, we'll look for signals from extraterrestrial technology. The sensitivity of the SKA means that we can increase the volume of space uh, where we can search for signals. Another activity will be searching for signatures of amino acids, which are the building blocks of life, which show radio emission at very specific frequencies so we can identify it quite readily. Um, they'll be able to answer questions uh, about planet formation by investigating the dusty disks um, around a large number of young stars, um, also allowing us to pinpoint planets in the habitable zone of nearby young stars. And what are some of the other questions that, uh, that SKA could possibly constrain? What does our galaxy look like? I mean, given the wealth of high resolution pictures of galaxies available, I think um, sometimes we forget that we don't have as clear a picture of our own galaxy um, due to our location within it. You know, it's very difficult for us to take a picture um, from inside our own galaxy. But the other thing I think is how, how the largest stars form. That's another huge question for me. Uh, these are the stars that have violent outflows, winds, they impart huge amounts of radiation into their surroundings and inject heavy elements into the universe, but we don't fully understand how they form. One other major area that I think the SKA will open up is uh, what we call the magnetic universe. But what the SKA is going to enable us to do is, is to probe you know, galactic-wide magnetic fields, even the intergalactic magnetic fields. Um, and to, to really be able to, 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 to get to the root cause of, you know, what, what causes magnetism? What, what's its impact on the evolution of, 
objects, galaxies, and the, the universe as a whole. I wonder if you just speak to the kind of magic of the radio spectrum. What what does this part, what does radio astronomy tell us that other um, wavelengths can't tell us about the universe? The clouds are transparent to radio waves. Radio telescopes can peer through the dust. Dust mm. is a major uh, component of, uh, of of the universe, of, of, of the galaxy. Uh, and with optical observations, you know, you, actually, if you look at, a, at our current pictures of, of the galaxy, we, as Sherry said, we see through the galactic plane. You see these huge um, dust clouds and uh, lanes of dust with, which are spread across these big optical images. If you look at the, those same areas with a radio telescope, you can see through that into what's at the uh, at the heart of these things. Can you give us a sense of how much it will, will be coming in, how much will be captured, and what is the challenge of dealing and processing with all of that information from outer space? The volume of data stored by the SKO would fill over a million 500 gigabyte laptops. The SKA will take the data, make the initial data products uh, that have been requested uh, by the astronomers in their observing proposals. The plan is to distribute uh, those data products to the SKA Regional Centre network where astronomers can access them and also conduct their scientific analysis for their really high impact um, science outcomes. But when do you think it will be complete? What's the construction going to look like? We've now started construction. Um, on the 29th of June this year. So sometime in 2028, uh, maybe 2029, we expect to finish construction. It's 2 billion euros for the, uh, required for the first 10 years to construct and operate uh, for, for that 10-year uh, that period. Astronomers don't have to wait until 2029 to get access to the SKA. It will come in stages. Uh, as we build it out. We'll be building it in phases, effectively. We've divided it up into four different uh, uh, stages within that construction program. Well, that's good to know that, yeah, even as it, uh, as it develops, there will be the ability to uh, actually use parts of it. What is it like to be working on this, something that has its origins decades ago and will be completed, you know, a decade from now? Um, in, intergenerational, international collaboration, all towards this common purpose. It's pretty amazing to think of all the high impact science uh, that the community will be able to achieve, you know, through the SKA. It's exciting and inspiring, but also really quite challenging at times. Um, and I, I really do see that last part, that the challenge is a good thing. Um, I think often, often I find myself in a position where we, we think about how we're going to do something and then we have to rethink uh, in order to get the best outcomes for the telescopes. Just the working in an international project with all the different cultures and uh, and, uh, and people that you know, we, we need to make it all happen, that is fantastically enjoyable. We cover 20 time zones on the planet. It really is truly global and that is a fun part of it. How would you say that someone who's out of the scientific sphere uh, could could feel enriched by this array. The public at large are, are wondering what's out there, what, what, what causes our universe to look like it does. But there's also practical things as well. One is Wi-Fi. Wi-Fi was invented by radio astronomers. Another area is um, imaging technologies. The imaging techniques that astronomers developed were adopted by the medical community. Uh, for nuclear magnetic resonance imaging and uh, other types of medical imaging. So we have to give, as well as that intellectual excitement of exploring the universe, also practical return uh, to, to, to people. I hope you get from what both Sherry and I have said is uh, exploration of the unknown. But when, whenever any new facility is built, you know, it's always going to discover new things. This is an area uh, of science that has Virgin blown up in the last uh, uh, the last few years, and the SKA would be perfectly positioned uh, to try and understand uh, or build on the understanding that other telescopes have delivered on on, the, on these phenomena. The, the universe will be our oyster uh, with the SKA.